know that we've been corresponding, uh, your church, I think we were here in um, about 2003, 04. Does anybody remember us? Okay. Well, I know we were here once, maybe since then, but uh, at my age, I don't remember. I don't know where I am half the time or who I am. And I know who my wife is. Uh, you want to wave your hand, sweetheart? This is my wife, Miriam. We have uh, started out, <clears throat> we started out in uh, 02 uh, to full time mission work and before that we were factory workers and she worked in a bakery and just like everybody else we had jobs, we had insurance, we had security and then somebody said uh, well you, you know if you want to follow your heart and be a missionary to a people group that we love so much, our people and uh, you know you, you step out on faith and your whole life changes and the wife says, look at the bills. How are we going to pay them? And uh, I said, well, it wasn't really my idea. I think it was the Lord's idea. So guess who can take care of our bills? The Lord can, right? And uh, so we, I guess we, our, our monthly bills were $800, and we were getting about 200 And uh, then we started on deputation. And the first place we went to had about 25 people for Sunday morning, you know, and I said, wow, how is this going to work? And the old pastor comes out and says, well, we're just, you know, we're just maxed out with missionaries, so we just can't really take anybody on right now, but, you know, uh, we want to give you a meeting and we want to encourage you. And, you know, I believe that God set it up that way. Uh, First Baptist Church of Eaton, you've, you have teamed with us and encouraged us and prayed for us. Our names are well known, I believe, to a lot of you because I know that you pray for us. Can I get an amen? I, I know you do, right? And, you know, that's what's so neat about, about uh, teaming up like that. And so we went to that church and I tried to preach and I was so nervous I couldn't talk, and, you know, and got through Sunday school and and somebody walks up and says, I tax the Amish. My wife and I would like to take you on for $50 a month. What? And then we did uh, church, you know, preached on, I tried to preach on Sunday morning, and, and God blessed it. And afterwards he says, well, we'll give you love offering, but we can't support you, the pastor said. He wrote a check for $500 for love offering. What, I mean, this little bitty church. And God kind of, you know, laughed at us and said, see, I'm in charge here. And uh, I don't just, you know, work through big churches, you know. A church is a church where God is working. And uh, so that was a blessing. Um, anyhow, um, so I have some, a little bit of literature here. This is actually my testimony book. My testimony can go on for hours, so... We won't do that tonight, but uh, I might, you know, I might tell you a few things. But uh, this is my testimony booklet, and, and uh, each family, I think we have enough for each family. I hope so. And um, so in there, my parents, I've always felt really close to my parents. And a story is in here, how that we prayed for my parents. I always prayed, you know, Lord, will you just give us... Even if it's on their deathbed, if I can just see them get saved yet before it's forever too late. And I think I prayed faithfully every day for over 20 years for my parents. And the day came when I shared the scripture with them. My mother had cancer, and my, di my dad had a, uh, a stroke and was not doing too well. And uh, they were getting old, and I said, God, you're going to have to help me now because... This is what I'm going to go try. You know, I felt all alone. I went all, all by myself and prayed and lit, listened to a large portion of Scripture all the way from Ohio to Wisconsin, like, you know, 12 hours one way. 
and just just felt close to the Lord and uh, got there and my dad was not friendly he said you can't come in the house and uh, he said he said this thing that you believe your 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 uh, strange belief that you have he said you're trying to I hear that you're trying to help other Amish people believe the way you do and he looked at me and he said, Paul, you're just going to take them to hell with you. That's what you're going to do. And I said, Dad, all I want to do is help people learn the Bible and live the Bible. And he said, well, whatever. And, uh, well, if you just wouldn't have left the Amish. See, they believe that once you leave the Amish, that's it for you. You know, if you're baptized into the Amish church, they, you're... Your safety, your salvation is in the church. And when you leave, if that was so, then you, when you left the church, you wouldn't have any hope anymore, right? And uh, they don't believe that you can know you're saved. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, a little bit later. But my parents, uh, you could read that story in here, how they got saved. Or I was influential. I don't think that, that they that I led them directly to the Lord that evening, but they were going to Mexico for my mother's cancer treatments, and God just worked a miracle. Uh, they had orientation with a, bunch, a group of people, you know, and, and the doctor said, well, I need to, to talk to Roy and Katie Koblenz, my parents, alone after everyone leaves. So they stayed, and he pulls out a Bible. And he said, you need... Jesus, more than you need me. And told him, you know, verses that, that uh, where Jesus promised, like, very, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life, you know. And they said, we, we, these verses were familiar, and here we, they were in, Mex they were in uh, California, Mexico, from Wisconsin. And so it's like a three-day trip, and they're in a foreign land, and the same God in the Holy Spirit speaks to their heart. Dad said, I looked at Mom, and Mom looked at me, and tears started coming down, and I looked up, and I said, that's God. Because this, this doctor, we came here to, you know, for physical help. And that happened. So they... They said, now we understand that we get to heaven by just putting our faith in Jesus. Jesus did it all for us. Why wow, isn't that exciting? I wanted to go and go, you know, shout and jump around, but, you know, I didn't know if he would have a heart attack if I did that. But. <laughs> so, anyhow, it's, he told me half a dozen times after that, whenever I saw him, I tried to go, you know, every year or at least every year and visit and he'd say, I'm going to see you in heaven. And before that, it was like, you can't come in the house. And you're heretic because you left the church like that, you know. Completely different. They wouldn't eat. They, in, the, in the shunning practice, you can't associate with, on, with, with someone that's in the band that's excommunicated. So the shunning involves not even taking something out of their hand or no association. They wouldn't be able to drive with us in a car and uh, on and on. So, you know, no invitations for weddings, no invitations for uh, holidays. So it's been over 40 years since I had a meal with, with our families, my wife as well. We're both the only one in our immediate family that's not strict Amish today yet. Though we had many opportunities to share the gospel with them, and my brother has really hardened since then. But uh, my parents had uh, 14 children. There was seven of each. And one of my, list, my, my little sisters couldn't eat and live for three days, but so there were 13 of us growing up, and uh, 
We have three children. My wife and I have three children, uh, two girls, and then God gave us a son after I prayed and said, you know, I'd like to have a son. What, how many years were we married? Seven or eight years. And, and uh, I got that, you know, I got that uh, desire to have a son and raise him up. And, and uh, I promised God if he give us a son, we would uh, give him back and, and train him, do the best we can to train him for, for God's use, whatever he would see fit, to however he would use him. And uh, today, Andrew pastors Decatur Baptist Church. And that's where we attend, and it's just a tremendous blessing. God has been so good to us. And um, Andrew and his wife have five children, and both our daughters have four children each. So we have 13 children. Three children and 13 children, but... Would you like to know how many grandchildren my mom and dad would have if they, if they were still here? 123. You can remember that, it's one, two, three, right? And, uh, but I didn't tell you yet how many great-grandchildren they, they, they have today. That's more like 525. So, yeah, large family, and I guess that's why, you know, you have a burden for your people, your family. Your family is large. My wife and I both have several uh, nieces and nephews who got saved and, and have come out. So that's a blessing. And, um, yes, um, We've been in full-time ministry for over 21 years now, and uh, in 2017, my wife uh, became very ill, and uh, we had to, you know, try to find out from doctors what's going on, and nobody could really figure out what it was, and I guess we were about uh, third or fourth doctor until one of them, uh, we had done blood work several times, and and uh, they couldn't really figure out what it was. There is a, uh, a rare uh, condition that she has. It's called MTHFR. Has anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. And uh, I think it, it's, it's something about missing chromosomes and, and not being able to make enough blood to, you know, blood cells to keep things going. And uh, this, this one doctor said she has that and, and uh, some things we have to do. And the research I did online said that 50% of patients with that do not live over 50. And she was 60. So we were counting our blessings and kept on doctoring and finally found out that uh, someone national known natural type doctor read her blood work and said oh you have a tumor in your parathyroid there's four four little glands about the size of rice behind the thyroid it's called the parathyroid and one of those glands can get big you know in a tight little spot it's like right here and so one of them had turned into a monster about the size of my thumb. And it just placed different things, was taking calcium out of the bones and putting it in the blood. And they said, oh, you got so much calcium and so high in the blood. You got, a, you got one of the monster tumors in you, in you. So they scheduled us for, I mean, she was down to 80 pounds, couldn't eat, hardly eat anything. Her liver just, you know, didn't make any bile and whatever. But anyhow, needless to say, uh, we, had, we had surgery and it was a very, very slow process. So from 2017 to 2019, uh, I did a lot of time at home with her and helping her whatever I could and spend time with God, wrote a book, my last book, uh, 
And uh, am I good enough to make it to heaven? I thought, you know, a lot of religions are trying to be good enough. That's what I was taught. I thought you had to do the best you can and still don't know for sure. And uh, so I wrote that book. And uh, anyhow, um, so uh, of course in 2019, so we, we did a, I did a lot of praying and I said, God, is our life over? My wife is ill and it looks kind of dark, you know. Sometimes things happen in your life that you need encouragement. I needed some encouragement, and I just spent a lot of time with the Lord and, and um, said, I, I'd like to have a minister with the Amish that is more hands-on. And he gave me an idea. He said, uh, you know, the Lord led me to a group of Amish that is called, they're called the New Order Amish. Now, there's the old order and the old or old order. It's, it's the old order and the old old order, and there's the new order and the new new order. Uh, now I, I hope I got you confused by now, but they're all horse and buggy Amish. And when they're horse and buggy, you know what that means? If they want to go uh, to Montana to another Amish community, uh, they're not going to get there with their horse and buggy from Ohio. Uh, let me just tell you about that. <laughs> but the New Order Amish are allowed to fly airplanes. Well, ride airplanes. I don't know if they fly them. But, <laughs> but uh, so just, when was it, Friday? I took, I took all, all the ministers to, all the ministers went to Montana to have communion services with a group out there that they have fellowship with. So tomorrow evening, I'm supposed to go to Columbus Airport and pick them up, bring them all home again. So now I'm, they don't believe in the shunning, like the old order, you know. But they're still horse and buggy, so everywhere they want to go that's, you know, out of town, they call Paul now. Because I, I went to, to him and said, you know, Lord gave me this idea if I would drive for them. Now, we were just outside a pretty, pretty large community in southern Ohio, but I got relatives, so many relatives there, they all knew who I was, and they wouldn't ride with me because of the shunning. So I went to the new order, and I said, you guys ever need drivers? They said, are you kidding me? All the time. So I said, well, we're considering moving here because it was the area where our son took a church, you know. So we were starting to go to attend church there. And uh, that Amish man said, if you move to this area, we'll put you to work. And you know, that was about two years ago. And did they ever, they, they worked me to death, you know? Uh, goodness, why did I do that? But no, I'm having a blast. As you can imagine, pretty soon I found out the bishop was my second cousin, and his wife is my wife's third cousin. And everybody's related to everybody. And I'm learning, you know, my relatives all over again, about 40 years later. And nobody knows me. Young people don't know who I am. And I can talk to about anybody. So the Lord has just really opened up this ministry for us. So well, I don't want to waste all my time just all about that. That's kind of where we're headed. If anybody has a question, I know I, you know, probably jump over a lot of stuff and I probably don't talk right. I know I got that accent people ask me about, right? But uh, don't be shy. If, if uh, you have a question, I'd be happy to try to answer it. Um, so we also have, uh, you have some Amish around here. I think they're starting to move in some, aren't they? A few? I talked to, your, to Pastor Stensis, and I was really looking forward to seeing him. Brother Joel, and, and he called and he said, what happened? He's, he's uh, in, uh, where, Oklahoma? And uh, he said, he really misses being here when we finally make it over here, so. But that's the way it goes. We can meet up some other time. You have a question? Uh, 
Um, we have the, the German and English track, and uh, so, you know, these, I just go straight to scripture, and see, when I was a teenager, I heard about John 3.16, it was a blessing to hear the little children recite that verse and others. Uh, but I knew what it said, you know, as a teenage Amish boy, but I had no clue what it, what it meant. You know, you could read, and I'd ask somebody, well, here it says you can have eternal life. And they would say, oh, that's not what that means. You know, okay, so how do they explain it away? You know how they explain that away? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting, should, have, should not perish but have everlasting life. Believing is, you, you don't, believing is not by itself, they would say. It is faith and you have to do something. You, you have to enter a covenant. Or, and that's, maybe that's partly true, brother, in some ways, but when Jesus makes a promise that if we're trusting in him like he many times did, John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath, hath everlasting life. Period. He didn't say if. You know, if you do this, if you're baptized, they would add something like that. They would add Avish clothes. They would add horse and buggy. They would add a hat, you know. They would add a lot of things, baptism in the church, church membership. And, you know, by the time you get through that whole list, you're as confused as the next person. Because... Which one of those is the most important thing then? You know, Jesus made it as clear as crystal clear, didn't he? He, he said those words, and you can bank on that because it was Jesus. You know, this morning a Sunday school teacher said, we can't, you know, he was reading there where the Pharisees, uh, even the believing Pharisees, they saw Jesus healing somebody. And they, and they opened the roof to bring that man to, to Jesus because there was no room to get through the door. Everybody was just packed, you know, packed out the house. And, and the Bible says he saw their faith. He could see. See, that's why it's so important. I'm getting a little off track, but that's why it's so important for us Christians to have a great testimony. Because other people are reading you. People see what you do, and that's scriptural. James, you know, in James it says, that how shall a man know? You, you say, uh, you got works for your salvation, uh, or you have faith, and I have works. And he said, you're really justified by your works. Wasn't, wasn't all these, these uh, men of faith in the Bible, weren't they justified by their works? Abraham and, and even Rahab the harlot? Well, yeah, because people saw what they, what they ended up doing. If I say, uh, I got saved today, and tomorrow I go to work and act the same as I always did, are people going to say, you got, yeah, yeah, I see you got saved? No, they aren't, are they? No, so it's so important that we, that we do have that. But uh, Jesus promised us, if we're trusting in him alone, in him. He promised we can have eternal life. And, uh, <clears throat> the, the scripture I used to get through to, to my parents was, was in 1 John 5. And uh, that, that's the, probably the uh, main scripture I would use. And simply for this reason, I know I know the Amish have taught us from when we were little 
Uh, they, they operate the church, uh, different things in the church. I won't go into detail, but where the Bible says by two or three witnesses, uh, what does it say there? Everything's established or every truth is established. I mean, we even use that in our laws, you know. Uh, a policeman will, he wants witnesses when there's an accident so that he can go to court. And uh, so witnesses are important. Uh, the three, we were always taught that two or three witnesses, everything shall stand. And in 1 John 5, it's, it talks about three witnesses from heaven. Huh? So I, I knew I had a case here because they understand three, the three witnesses. I, and it says, if we believe the witnesses of men, the witness of God is greater. I showed my parents that. They didn't want to hear it from me. I was probably the last person on earth they want to hear preaching from, you know, that evening. But uh, my dad actually said, Paul, stop. You're not a preacher. You're a heretic. You left the Amish church. He said those words. But the Holy Spirit said, keep on preaching. There's people praying. So I kept on preaching. And I said, well, it doesn't really matter if I say it or if I don't say it. It's here in the Bible. It's God's word. You can't, you can't say it's not true because God wrote it. I'm just telling you what it says, and I memorized 1 John 5 in German. And that's what they, they, they just, their, their, term, their service are all in German. Okay. And German singing, German Bible, Martin Luther German, uh, on and on. So I memorized, I knew that if I want to get through to them, I got to memorize it in German. And God used that. And I said, now it says here, if we believe the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. This is, these three from heaven, they're from heaven. Okay? God, the word, and the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to say what that witness or what the record is of God concerning Jesus. And it was simply if we believe in him, we have to witness in ourselves. And it went on to say that uh, if we don't believe God, God's record, we make him a liar. And I looked at my dear mother and I said, Mom, would you make God a liar? She said, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I said, I knew you didn't. Then you have to believe it. See? You just make him a liar if you say, she starts saying, oh, no, no, no. No, I, I said, it, it says right here. I said, Mom, do you have Jesus? Because you have cancer. And if nature takes its way, you won't live very much longer. I said, you'll be in heaven or in hell, according to the Bible. I said, do you have Jesus? You have to have Jesus. Because here it says, he that hath the Son hath life. It's talking about eternal life. See, it's right there. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may, what? No. That you, what? Have. She said, well, I can't know if I have Jesus or not because I might still sin and I might lose him before I die. That's what she said. And I said, well, here it says, if we have the Son, we have eternal life. And it said, and I said, now when does it say we have it? These things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have eternal life. That you may know that you have eternal life and believe and keep believing. And, uh, yeah, a few days later, the doctor's telling them some of the same things. And God, God saved them because, you know, you know how I know? The next time we came to, 
to their house. We knocked on the door. And remember, he didn't let us in. He didn't let me in that night before. He didn't even go to the door. He said, come on in. Like, was he peeping in the window? How does he know who we are? He may run us back out when we start. So we walked in. He goes, oh, Paul and Miriam, it's so good to see you. Please come in. Have you had anything to eat? We have supper, you know. We're almost finished, but we have leftovers, and you're welcome to eat. What? He said, do you have a place to stay the night? And I said, well, we got plans, but thank you. He said, you can stay right here. What? What changed? And his conversation was completely different. He was smiling and was asking me questions about, you know, just the president or whatever came in his mind, you know, how things, you know, like, I'm like, something changed. But I didn't want to, you know, embarrass him. And he finally, he said, Paul, you probably realized that things are different. I said, what do you mean? Tell me about it. And he said, so he told the story about Mexico that I told you. And he said, now we understand. He looked at mom and smiled, and he said, now we understand that we get to heaven by just believing in Jesus. He said, these clothes and being Amish, he said, that's not what saves us. What? I mean, (laughs) praise the Lord. But anyhow, uh, I got a few minutes here, and the Lord laid a little bit something on my heart I want to challenge you with tonight. If you would turn to Matthew, or Mark, if you turn to Mark, Mark chapter 1, okay, Mark chapter 1, in verse number 15, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, this is, um, it says in verse 14, Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And that's what he said. That was the, the gospel as Jesus preached it when he first started his ministry. And I've often, often, uh, you know, had an interest in seeing how Jesus did things. And I want to do, I want to, I want to be like, you know, whatever he said, I want to make sure I'm saying it right, whatever. The only thing I haven't figured out yet is how not to have funerals. He never had funerals. He just raised the dead. But, um, so here, um, I just want you to, to follow along with me a little bit here on repentance. Repent ye. What is he meaning? What does it mean to repent? Repent ye. Then, the, then it, to finish the verse, it says, what? And believe the gospel. So repenting is, is only part of it. The second part is to believe the gospel. Well, the gospel is repent and believe. It's, it's, it's right there. I believe it's right there. But to, to really understand what repent means, we know that repenting has to do with, you know, uh, when, you see, when, you, when we catch ourselves doing, doing the wrong things, like like trusting in a religion, for example. Uh, Or if we're in sin. Repenting is is doing something different. Don't continue down that road, is what he's saying. Amen? And so I did a study on repentance, and I found that 
In uh, Jeremiah, for the sake of time, Jeremiah 26 and verse 3, in the Old Testament, we read that God repented. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way. See, there's t that turning. That's repenting for man. That I may repent me of the evil, God said, which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. He said, I'm going to do this if you're going to do that. But you know, as we keep reading in some of these verses where it says God repented because he's merciful. And now God, did God ever sin? Talk back to me. Did God ever sin? So then he wasn't repenting because of sinning. But what was he doing? Verse 13, therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he has pronounced against you. That's because he's merciful. He said, he's going to, if you turn from your ways, he's going to turn from the evil he was going to do. Uh, the punishment. Okay. So let's, let's go to another one in... Uh, in Jonah, I'm going to read here, uh, in Jonah, and uh, you don't have to turn there unless you want to, but uh, in Jonah and uh, chapter 3 and verse 10, the Bible says, and God saw their works. Remember Jonah? He was supposed to go preach to this wicked Nineveh, huge city. And he went in there and started preaching, and I guess a preacher's dream, his message worked. And it doesn't even say that he preached much. He just kind of stated a fact, you know, God said, in 40 days, this city will be destroyed. And they repented, didn't they? They repented. Now, now see what God said? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not so God repented he changed his mind that's what I believe that that repent means when he started preaching the gospel John the Baptist and Jesus they started the ministry by saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand so it was a it is a repentance. For me, it was stop trying to trust in Amish clothes and all these different things in a religion, religious tradi traditions, okay? That was repentance for me. I had to turn to the Bible. I had to turn to God. I had to turn to truth. And... Uh, and God saved me, but uh, maybe uh, maybe a couple more of these. And I found it very interesting. First Chronicles and uh, twenty-one. First Chronicles twenty-one and verse fifteen. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. Well, that sounds bad. And as he was destroying the angel, God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. Because he was, you know, pouring out his judgment, his wrath upon a people that had disobeyed. Folks, America isn't too much better nowadays. You have to look around and wonder, well, where in the world are we at? And, you know... And I look, I look at this, and I see what it says. He sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld. That means he looked. And he couldn't hardly, he couldn't hardly stand it, I guess. He said, and he said to the angel that destroyed it, it is enough. 
He stopped the angel. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. See, God repented. Was, uh, so in Psalm 106, in Psalm 106, one more verse about that. Psalm 106 and, okay, I'm still not there. And verse number 45. Somebody read that because I can't get there. Okay, verse 45. And it's talking about God. It said, And he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. You see that? And here's what I recommend for us as Americans. It's hard for Christians to see much TV or news anymore. It's so corrupt and, and uh, so many lies are being said and you don't know some kind of, sometimes difficult to find out who's even telling the truth. But you know what we can do is pray for mercy. This country, you have to wonder, sometimes you have to just wonder if how God can bless us anymore. Are you there or is it just me? But we can pray for mercy. God is merciful. In Lamentations, the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. I love mornings when I finally start waking up, you know. I love mornings, and it's all fresh. The morning is new, and you can ask God for mercy. He's ready to forgive. Okay, so what have we learned? What is repentance? It's not so much stopping to sin, because then that would be a work, wouldn't it? You can't stop sinning. You can turn, you can pray and ask God to help you turn from your sin. I recommend that. But it's really a turning from, from something. A lot of people are, are false, have false hopes of heaven because they're trusting in the wrong things, right? So you've got to stop trusting the wrong thing. Come over here and turn and repent. They have to change from the wrong thing to Jesus, the right one. And now I want to share one verse and we're through. And that one is in Colossians. Colossians 2, if you turn there for our last scripture. Colossians 2 in the New Testament and Verse number six, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Verse seven says, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, we probably heard that nearly every Sunday in the Amish church. And they were, in, see, you can, interpreting, if you don't understand how you're saved and you don't know you're saved, and they don't preach self, Bible salvation. And it says, as ye have therefore received Christ, or as ye have accepted Christ, you know, uh, for them it's in the church. So for them, that means you have accepted Christ in the Amish church. See that, how they make that fit? And it says, walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and 
established in the what? Faith, in the creed or in the religion or a faith. They just read all that in there and they had us fearing that, you know, they said if there's any one thing, I get this, this is my main point, if there's any one thing that we Amish have to learn and understand, it's that we cannot change. We were born and raised this way, and if we change, we're going to hell. Now that's exactly opposite from repenting. Did you catch that? Wow. That's what pushed, that was pushed down our throat. We kept, kept hearing it maybe every, and my mom preached that to me even after, after we left and I thought they're saved. Whenever she'd visit me, she'd say, Paul, you still need to come back and be Amish, even though you're trusting in Jesus to be saved. You still need to be Amish. We need to go to church together and, you know, and like Colossians 2 says, you stay in the faith you've been taught. It's, it's dangerous to be going in a different direction. But you know what the main problem is, folks? He's saying, stay in the way I taught you. They're missing the first chapter. Read the first chapter. You can't get to, to chapter 2 without chapter 1. Chapter 1, he laid the groundwork and said, this is how you're saved. See? And they just, you know, religions are started by picking out a few little verses and misinterpreting them. But... Uh, so, as ye have therefore received Christ the Lord, so walk ye in him, build up, rooted and build up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And they made a point of saying, you know, we shouldn't want something else. We should be thankful for being Amish, and, you know, we're separate from the world, and we can do our own thing, and, you know. But you know what the very next verse says? Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Wow. After rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So my mom would preach that one day. I remember the last time we were starting this mission work. We lived in a trailer in West Salem, Ohio. And they came there to visit. They were from Wisconsin. And they came there. And my mother started preaching that to me again. See, so as I did many times, I, I would I'd try to make her think, and I'd say, so you're telling me that if a person was born Catholic, he's got to stay Catholic. Yeah. You know, I started naming about half a dozen different denominations and religions and yeah yeah that's what it means that's what it means and I said did you know that those Muslims they say that flew the planes in the towers in New York that they did that because of their religion I said are you telling me those Muslims have to stay the way they've been taught and that was the first time she couldn't answer that so I did make her think, but anyhow, forever what it's worth. But we always had, you know, had a good time when we visited, and we're glad to see them. And uh, Brother Joel, if you, I'm, I'm through, and you've been a good crowd. I'm really happy to see you. When we pulled in, I told my wife, I said, this is First Baptist of Eden? I don't recall anything like this. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's exciting to see what, what you folks are doing here, how the Lord's blessing you. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Let's, let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes.